Hey everyone, welcome to another episode. And today we are going to talk about ROC curves and precision recall curves. Understand why they're important, what they do, and even come up with an implementation from scratch in Python of how to just come about both precision recall curves and ROC curves. So let's get to it. All right, so in this notebook, uh, importing a basic libraries, pandas, data frame manipulation library, NumPy is our math library, make classification is um, used to create our classification dummy data set, just to create dummy data, test train split, to split test and train sets. Um, and I have like a bunch of built in metrics here for uh, creating, well, the meat of this entire video, which is precision recall curves as well as ROC curves. Uh, we'll also code these out from scratch individually, so that's more to come below. And then we have logistic regression, just a, a built-in classifier. That'll be uh, the example that we're using for the model in this video. Okay, so now I kind of split this up into two cases of balanced and unbalanced classes because you can really see the difference between ROC curves and precision recall curves for both of these cases. So let's get to that. <clears throat> so in this first little chunk of cell right here, I'm just creating our dummy data. Uh, basically 10,000 samples, four features, all of them good numerical features, where the positive and negative classes are evenly split, 5,000 each. And then I'm creating a bunch of, I mean, just creating column names for each called feet one to feet four and uh, converting it to a data frame. And that's it. And you get, here's like an example uh, sample from that data frame of 10,000 rows. So you have four features, numeric and a label. Okay, so now what we're doing is uh, we'll basically split our data set into test and train sets with like a 90-10 split. I'm putting shuffle is equal to false here because um, this is very application dependent. Uh, you know, certain situations data has timestamps or date stamps and you don't wanna shuffle them together because you'll be training potentially on data that's in your test set and also vice versa, which could lead to data leakage. We don't want that. Um, but depending on the situation, you can, you can change this. And then yeah, just splitting into test and train sets. And with that data, we are fitting a typical logistic regression classifier. Nothing too fancy here. Now for evaluating our model, uh, we have a little function here called evaluation where we're passing in the classifier that we fitted along with some X, which will be a set of features and Y, which will be the true ground labels. Now in this first line, we are just getting predictions from our model, pass all the X's in, get the predicted Y's, which will be in the form of a probability. And hence I called it Y predict proba, right? Uh, and with this first line right here, we're calling the scikit-learns precision recall curve by passing in the ground label as well as the set of predictions that we've made. And using this, it'll give us three items back. All three of them are lists or arrays. So if, let's say like um, this will be a list of precisions, this will be a list of recalls, and this will be the list of thresholds at which we got each precision and each recall. So one of these could be 50%, um, maybe like for the corresponding, let's say the 10th entry is 50%, precision in the 10th entry and the precision array would be the precision at 50%, uh, and, the 10 and then at the 50% threshold and same for recall. So what essentially this is doing is like you have this model, right? And it's really hard to determine sometimes what threshold is suitable. Typically we go with 50%, but in some cases 30% may be better. Some cases 70% may be better. And by using this function here, we can get the value of precision and recall at each of the thresholds that we could potentially choose. And this is kind of an edge over simply arbitrarily choosing a specific precision and specific recall, because now like by just computing the area under that curve, we have a single metric that could take into account any threshold and is not based on or dependent on any source of arbitrariness that we would, you know, we would use in modeling. And hence, you know, a AUCs are pretty useful in general. Um, I think I skipped this line and this is just used for 
the same thing instead of a precision recall curve where, you know, the y-axis precision, x-axis is recall. We have the typical ROC curves where, you know, the y-axis could be like true positive rate and the x-axis could be false positive rate. Again, we pass in the ground labels and the predictions and we get similar arrays of false positive rates, true positive rates, and the thresholds at which they exist. Um, just returning a JSON dictionary for uh, just come now we can with AUC again, it's a built in function that takes a list of all the x axis, the y axes, and the x axes, and then it is used well just to compute the area under the corresponding curve created by that graph, right? It's pretty neat, very simple function that will return a number. And so, if we just call our functions on our train and test set, we get the train and test AUCs for both cases. Now, just looking at the test set, well, I mean, they're all like 95% precision, 95% recall. So, sorry, 95% um, AUC under the ROC curve, 95% AUC under the PR precision recall curve. So, yeah, all in all, pretty good model. Yeah, pretty well performing. Now, there's not really much of a difference between these two until we actually look at case two, which isn't using this on an unbalanced data set. So like before, we create a classification data set, but this time the weights are like uh, 90%, 90, we're gonna create like 90% of the labels, which is 9,000 of the samples will be of the negative class and only 1,000 will be of the positive class. And we split our data set in the same way, but this time when training our model, we're gonna pass in this parameter called class weight is equal to balanced, with this, we're telling logistic regression to say, hey, because there are nine times more negative samples than there are positive samples, when training, we want to weight the samples of the positive class nine times more than that of the negative class. This is kind of required. This and potentially undersampling would also be required because you need your model to be able to predict or rather interpret and detect these small instances of positive classes or positive labels that occur in your data. Without it, it's just going to perform much worse. Now, uh, looking at, uh, we're just calling the same evaluation function, and it's only here now that you can see the true difference between just a simple ROC curve versus a precision recall curve, right? While the ROC values might be super high and they, they get you really excited, this 70% is more likely how your model is currently performing, right? Because my hunch is, and you can also check this with the data, is that there is so, uh, because of the few positive classes, your model finds it a little hard to detect them. And so our precision is tanked, but our recall is pretty high. And that's why this might be a more indicative of actual performance and the kind of performance that we would be looking for anyways. So yeah, that's also uh, kind of what we called out here. So why use precision recall curves over ROC curves in some cases? It's because of class imbalances. Okay, that's like the main takeaway from this section right here that we just went through. But all of this is just using, you know, these black box, um, you know, functions that are built in so well in scikit-learn that you should be using, by the way. Uh, but let's pick it apart a little bit and try to implement those functions ourselves. So let's create them so that you get a better understanding. Now, the first thing to note, though, I kind of put this under a big note right here, is that the area under a curve in scikit-learn is typically found by using the trapezoid rule. So if you, and as of proof, like you can kind of go into scikit-learn's documentation and you see, okay, this is like a, this is the AUC function that we've been using before. And if you scroll down here, you'll kind of see this little highlighted thing that I've made here where it's calling a numpy.trapz and passing in y and x. y and x being like lists of values, like lists of precisions, lists of recalls, or lists of true positives, a list of false positives, like I mentioned before. And with this, it's basically going to perform the trapezoid rule. If, I mean, I'm not sure if you remember that, but um, if you kind of remember in high school, there is this little, uh, let me try to open it. Ah, these are, yeah. I might have closed it here, but let me actually just Google a trapezoid rule real quick and get back to you. Okay, so this is a super simple example where, you know, maybe your curve might be like, a little bit more smooth than this. But with the trapezoid rule, what we can do is, you know, kind of create very distinct lines. And it's an it's a method of finding an area by splitting up your entire curve into, you know, probably vertical sections, and then finding the area of those components. 
And typically those components will be like, you know, from 0 0.25, ooh, from 0 0.25 to 0 0.5, it looks like a trapezoid. And you can use like the trapezium formula in order the trapezium area formula or area within a trapezium to just find, you know, this area. And similarly, we'd find this big chunk area. And then we would find this little triangle area and then add them all up to get the overall corresponding area of this curve. And that's how you would kind of find a uh, area under a curve, right? And that's kind of how you would use a trapezoid rule in general, right? And that's kind of what's going on here. Now, what we're gonna do, uh, we're gonna kind of use that logic too, just uh, for context. So first, ROC AUC manual is our manual. Uh, it's This is going to be the manual function that we use, which inputs uh, ground, a set of ground labels and a set of predictions, kind of like what we did before, right over here. Yeah, same inputs. But the outputs are going to be, well, I'm just going to output the area under the curve, which is the AUC, right? So first of all, what we're doing is we're creating data frames for a set of predictions and a set of labels, There's two columns in that data frame, and are initializing all the false positives and true positives that occur to be just empty lists. And let's say that we want to evaluate this for 100 thresholds between 0 and 1 at you know intervals of like 0, 0 0.01, 0 0.02. So if we had used those thresholds, like 1%, 2%, all the way up to 100%, what would have been the corresponding false positive rates and true positive rates? That we're doing in this function here. So for every one of those thresholds, I'm computing true and false positives, true and false negatives, uh, false, false positives and false negatives, sorry, and then appending it to our list and what I'm doing right here is I'm saying like direction is either negative or positive because there are situations where, you know, your precision, uh, because of the nature of the curve, it might be in one direction or in like sloping upwards or just like coming downwards that um, the the value that's returned by N, uh, NumPy's trap Z could be negative. So we just want the absolute value of that. And we're returning that as the main area. All right, so now that that's taken care of, for um, I'm gonna do the same thing now for precision recall. Basically, we're taking in ground labels, we're taking in the predictions, we are constructing data frame, a data frame of two columns of predictions and the corresponding label, the predictions being in terms of probability values, by the way. And then we're gonna say, okay, let's create two empty lists of precision recall. The thresholds we're gonna do from zero to 100, and we are going to compute precision and recall. So precision and recall will end up to be like a list of 100 elements at different time, at different items. It'll be like the um, the precision recall at different thresholds. And now we have well, and then we compute the area, which is using the trapezoid rule. NumPy has a built-in function for it. Now what we can do is, well, in our new evaluation function that I'm creating, it takes in, it has the same um, input arguments as a train classifier, which is our logistic regression train classifier, a set of X's and actual ground truth label Y's. So with that, we're making a prediction using the built-in functions to, to determine the area under the curve for the precision recall curves, which we did before, but I'm also adding in manual calls to our ROC and uh, precision recall so that we can compare all these values together. With that, let's take a look at how our um, values look. So for the balanced data set case, it looks like, well, the, the built-in ROC and the ROC here, they agree with each other. Same with the built-in precision recall metrics, they also agree with each other, which means that we implemented it pretty good. And with the unbalanced data set case as well, you kind of see that these the values that are to be matched from you know the built-in scikit-learn version as well as our version, they do match up pretty well, you know. Now you might see like there are like subtle differences between you know like these values for precision. It's mostly because the precision recall curves, like the way that it is determined, is not exactly the way that I have typed it out. And in fact, let's see if I could pull that up. Um, if I can pull that up right here, right? So we have this uh, function, right? That's built in the precision recall curve. But what it does is it, in reality, it makes a call to this 
binary CLF curve, which basically it outputs a list of false positives and true positives. It's kind of like the base uh, function for also the ROC curve that's built in. You can check it out on scikit-learn. And it's from that that we're doing a bunch of like other processing here. And because of slightly different methods of computing the same thing, you'll see that there are slightly different values that are outputted. But more or less, this is still the overall logic that's also very you know intuitive to us. Uh, the main takeaways that I want you to get out of this though are it is also one, first of all, it's also better to use AUC over just specific precision recall scores because when you're calculating precision and recall at like 50% thresholds, like you don't know if that threshold is the best. And also there is a sense of arbitrariness in just choosing that threshold and computing an area under a curve removes that sense of arbitrariness because we can see how the model's performing at all thresholds. So it's a better single metric that removes a sense of arbitrariness. And also, like I mentioned up here, wherever I mentioned it here, yeah, precision recall curves can be very useful in evaluating models where there's high data imbalances. So you might wanna check that out too. I'll put all of this code in the description down below. It's a link on my GitHub. Uh, I encourage you to check out uh, probably the trapezoid rule, certain other things like, uh, uh, you know, the, the actual coding documentation for each one of these libraries. Now, one last thing, a tidbit before we leave, is that I have this function here called average precision score that I'd never really used. But this is an alternative case to computing um, area under the PR curve, right? And why it's an alternative case is, well, if you look at the documentation here, you know what, um, when you when you look at uh, the AUC and how it's computed with the trapezoid rule, there's interpolation that is actually happening. So let's say you look at this particular, you know, ROC curve, right? So it's zero, it's zero. At 0 0.25 for a false positive rate, it's a 0 0.5 true positive rate. But in these values, it kind of looks like, well, at 0 0.2, the value would be something around 0.3 for a true positive rate, which honestly isn't necessarily the case, right? And this could be a difference. It, it's only because here in this case, there's only like four thresholds that we're actually using. And in my example, there were a hundred thresholds. So the more number of thresholds that you use, the more accurate will be the representation with the ROC implementation that we made. But, um, you know, it, sometimes in this case, it might be a little too optimistic. And in which case we might want to use like step function wise. So it would go kind of like how my cursor is being traced, right? And we only want to use step function wise uh, characteristics. What it would do is it would actually decrease though the value of the area under the curve. And I think if you read this documentation, it's exactly what it says because the linear interpolation, lin linear interpolation, just connecting two points could be too optimistic is why this might be another alternative solution to evaluating how a model performs. Now, when you're comparing two models together, it kind of makes, um, doesn't make too much of a difference because you're only concerned with what is one, is one greater than the other. But this might be still a good method or a good function to use in scikit-learn. And you can just check out the source documentation here, along with everything else. I'll just put it in the description down below. So that's all I have for you today. If you like what you saw, please hit the like, please subscribe, hit that bell, and yeah, just have a good day. Happy coding, happy data sciencing. Take care.